Lock it. Making your way in the world can be hard enough. I'll check my bathroom. I have to make sure the toilet lid is closed. It doesn't matter how many times I do it, I just say a number. One, two, three, four, five. When you suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder, it can be a nightmare. I just feel like if I don't rush, there'll be like a bomb or a fire. Sorry. <laughs> We follow the extraordinary lives of four young sufferers as they attempt to live a normal life. In, in my head, it feels like it's brushing the bacteria of other people through my hair. I feel like I have to be prepared for every bad situation that's going to happen in my life. These are incredible first-hand accounts of days consumed by routines and rituals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The spoon has to be tapped in a set way. But I thought everybody did this, but apparently people don't disinfect their books. I have to tap this cat flap. Revealing their private battles with frightening, intrusive thoughts. I worry that the house is going to gradually fill with water. Imagine doing this at 2 o'clock in the morning. Every day, the same thoughts over and over and over and over again. As they fight to conquer their demons, to take those first steps into adulthood. And if nobody stops me, I'll just keep going. I've always maintained that I won't let the OCD defeat me. I've come a long way since last year. I'm proud of you. We're out. The thought of even, like, stopping now really terrifies me. It's estimated that one in 55 young adults in Britain have OCD. One of them is 23-year-old Nikita. She lives in East Yorkshire. The best way to explain it is, you know when you watch soaps and there's like a bad guy on there and they sort of blackmail someone into doing what they want, so then the person ends up giving him thinking that it'll stop and they'll go away, but then they keep coming back. That's exactly how it is for me, except it's my thoughts that are doing it. Nikita's been struggling with OCD since the age of 11, when intrusive thoughts started to drive her to perform certain rituals. I'm just going to wash my hands. I do it twice, that way, like, the sink won't flood, or, again, it's just if something bad happens, pumping of the soap will be twice, the taps twice, and then that's it, it's all fine, everything's safe. Nikita lives with her mum, Tracy, and dogs, Max and Billy. Her obsessions, known as intrusive thoughts, are based around a fear something bad will happen to them. We're best friends, aren't we? We are, definitely. Best friends, flatmates. Yeah, roomies. Roomies. <laughs> Do you want a cuppa? Please. Yeah. Mm. For anybody else that makes a cup of tea, it's just pouring it, sugar, milk, whatever, and then taking it away, but it's quite a bit of a chore for me. And with this, the lid's got to come off and then go back on and then come back off. And then I have to tap it. It feels in a way like, like how some people have a dance routine. It's my routine, but for tea, which makes it sound a bit better than what it is. The spoon has to be tapped in a set way. And then once that's done, you like scrape, tap, scrape tap together and that's it, it's complete and then everything's fine. I feel very sorry for her because it can't be nice having that in your mind all the time and fearing the worst and you, she does, you know, she opens up and she tells me and she does, she feels terrible. 
I told you on the other day, didn't I, that you actually didn't know about? Yeah, about the burning, when you burn yourself. Yeah, if I'm straightening my hair or, like, cooking or whatever, if I accidentally touch the straightener or touch the kettle or the pan and I've burnt myself, I then have to do it again because it's as if instantly there's that bully there saying, no, oh, you have to touch that again because if you don't, something bad's going to happen. So, in a way, it's kind of like, punish yourself, otherwise I'm going to punish those around you. And I find that quite upsetting. We do laugh about it, but you've got to do. Because if you didn't, you'd be really upset, but we do have a good giggle about it sometimes. I would rather make jokes, cos then I don't feel as strange. You're not strange. But it feels it. Mm. We're together, in it. OCD can manifest itself in many different ways. 18-year-old William lives in Cheshire. He suffers with contamination OCD, and he's frightened of busy places, convinced something terrible will happen. Going to the hairdressers is a huge trigger for William's anxiety. For me, it's massive. It's probably one of the biggest problems that I have, is going to the hairdressers. Um, it's a problem that I've had since a child. The anxiety. Um, starts physically, you know, going through my body, you know, I can feel shaking, trembling, you know, I get very tight all over. And then obviously there's the mental anxiety of just what could happen, you know, is there someone going to be outside, is someone going to come in and shoot us all and things, all those sorts of things start to go through my head and it's not nice. Um, one on my side and then on the top as well. Yeah. The anxiety kicks in as soon as I kind of sit down. Obviously, as soon as I've set my glasses off, I can't see what's going on outside, things like that. So the panic kind of kicks in of being trapped in here. So having whitish hair, just like I have my teeth whitened, that's my association that it's clean. To me, there's no bacteria on my hair, there's no bacteria on my teeth. Obviously, I know that's not true, just because it's a colour. But it's a significant difference in the anxiety. William worries about bacteria being spread through the brushes and scissors. In, in my head, it feels like when it's been brushed, that it's brushing the bacteria of other people through my hair. Um, and it's, you know, spreading through my hair. So all that's going through my head is, oh, what if there's Ebola, or what if there's, you know, all these things which are totally irrational, but, but on the other hand, they're totally real. An hour into the haircut, William's fear of an attack takes over and he decides to check the news. If anything has happened, he'll drive off to a secluded place where he feels safe. I'm always online. If anything happens, I want to know about it. So I've got all the alerts set up. So if anything happens or anything happens in Wilmslow or whatever town I'm in, my phone will start beeping. My safe place, um, depending on what's happened, I start by just going up north. I start to go for the Pennines, Yorkshire Pennines. Um, I'll, you know, stop along the way where it's completely open and quiet. I did so the other day when I thought something had happened in Mathersfield when I was driving. So I went up um, over the Peter Street, parked up, sat with my phone, keeping an eye out until the police had resolved the matter. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much. Now that I know what I'm leaving, it's, you can already start to feel it just relieving already. Obsessive compulsive disorder can invade all areas of sufferers' lives. 28 year old Charlie is a dog walker and a professional violinist in London. So we've got Taffy, Missy, Ernie, eggs. For some reason, the only thing he would ever eat is eggs. Wait, look, he's pushing her out the way again. What are you doing? There we go. Ugh, take the hand off, right? O on the walks, it's more anxiety than OCD. It's just always making sure the dogs are around me. If they run off for a bit, I will always worry they're not going to come back. I will catastrophize with that. The OCDs come out when I'm dropping off and picking up. So it does take me a while to leave clients' houses sometimes because I'm always checking doors or checking taps are off or something. He runs his dog walking business with wife Leanne. We got married, what, two years ago nearly? Yeah. 
So I've been together about six years. OCD moments feel... I would say it's the same feeling as, an, as, as having a mini anxiety attack, which is, you know, stomach knotting, butterflies, sometimes shaking. There she is. Aww. Hey, baby. This is Cora. If you've seen the way she walks, but the part of her brain that controls her movements is not working properly, essentially. But she's a perfectly healthy cat. <laughs> Charlie was diagnosed with OCD at the age of just 12. He'd been experiencing frightening, intrusive thoughts since he was very young. Well, it started out with separa separation anxiety. When I used to go to, a, to a, um, a music college on a Saturday, my parents would come with me. So whenever I had to go off to a class or something, I'd always get incredibly worried that my parents were either going to die or abandon me or I wouldn't be able to find them again. So it's sort of stemmed from that. And then from that, OCD started to manifest itself mainly for things to do with safety. If I didn't do my rituals, I'd be incredibly worried that the house would burn down. If, the, for example, if the oven was left on, the heat would make something catch fire. All this is scientifically not even right. I know that it, it, to some people it will sound a bit stupid, but in my head it's very real. That's the problem with it. If I have to make sure a door's closed, lock it, and then sometimes I'll just have to stare at it and do that. So if that, that felt not great to me, so I have to do it again. If I leave a tap running, honestly in my head I worry that the house is going to gradually fill with water and everything in, in the house is going to drown. Sometimes I'll have to run my hand under it to know that there's nothing coming out of the tap. If a drop of water goes on my hand, it's back, back, back to square one. Even though that just wouldn't happen, in the moment, OCD makes it incredibly real. Imagine doing this at two o'clock in the morning when I should be asleep and I have a bit busy day at work the next day. Each OCD sufferer has their own unique combination of routines. In East Yorkshire, Nikita is carrying out her stair ritual. She does this up to a dozen times a day. Coming down, it's got to be both feet on the next step. And then it's down, then up, and then down. And then I stop when I can reach this bit and touch it like four times with both hands. And then the same with this bit. And then it's done. It's got to be done, because if not, then something bad will happen, like, on my journey or at home when I've, like, gone out, or something will happen to me and my mum my dog's inside the house. I've just got to do it. One of Nikita's most extreme OCD traits is collecting phone screenshots. She constantly takes pictures of even number times. This obsession takes up hours each day. So what I do is screenshot whether that's on my phone or on my laptop. Um, if the time's on an even number and I'm, I, like, catch it. I then have to screenshot it, like, two to four times. The only time it's not even is if it's, like, two lots of the same. So, like, 12, 12, 13, 13. Cos then I feel like, cos there's two of them, that's all right and then I'll put them in a folder. On here, I think there's about 15,000, and I, I dread to think hard drive-wise, because this is my second hard drive. I hate it, but I can't not do it. The thought of even, like, stopping now really terrifies me. Every single night before bed, Nikita must carry out a set pattern of rituals which make her feel safe. Then I'll set two alarms for tomorrow. Um, not because I need to, just because it's two. And there's always like a two minute time difference. 
now because it's on 10 past 10 and then screenshot that two to four times and then before the last thing I do is I look at every corner like twice then I can lay down and go to sleep um, but now because I've just accidentally looked up there I've then got to do it again and then that's fine everything's done and I can sleep easy now Vicky is 25 and lives with her parents in Staffordshire. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. If nobody stops me, I'll just keep going. She suffered with extreme OCD for as long as she can remember and was diagnosed six years ago. I think it's important for people to understand that just because somebody's not physically washing their hands 100 times a day, that they're not going through absolute hell, like up, up in there, because it is, I think the intrusive thoughts are awful. Her OCD has been particularly bad this week. So the only way I can describe to people that don't have OCD what it feels like on really bad days, like this week, is it feels like I'm not made out of bones or muscles or organs. I'm just made out of the same two or three thoughts I've got I can just feel the sickness in your chest constantly and the same thoughts over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Vicky is a mental health support worker, but she hasn't managed to go to work this week. Bad intrusive thoughts are consuming her, driving her to carry out repetitive rituals. If I am like reaching a really bad crisis point, then I will just start kind of going round, usually 30 times, 30 is my number. And then obviously when I start to feel a bit dizzy or sick, I like to be grounded. And I will literally just lie here, either focusing on the fan or the paper, just for hours, just completely zoned out. One of Vicky's obsessive compulsions is face picking. She pulls out the small hairs on her face to take her mind off bad thoughts. I tend to look at every little mark, usually underneath my chin. But you can see there, they leave little bumps. I've got one on my neck as well, I've picked her on my neck. Sometimes I don't realise I'm doing it. If I'm really upset, like at night time, I'll do it in the night and I'll wake up and my face will be bleeding, so I've been doing it, like when I've been half asleep. And then sometimes I'll choose to do it because I'm in an uncomfortable situation or if I'm somewhere where I don't know anybody. But it's usually when I'm obsessing over a thought. And I hate it, I get really upset, but then I'll go straight back to picking. William has purposely chosen a job that works around his OCD fears. I support a number of small businesses with web design, web development and marketing. Obviously I only go for small businesses and kind of startups because they don't have to go into big offices. It kind of works around my OCD. William was diagnosed with OCD at the age of 15 when his symptoms were at their worst. His fear of crowds affects him everywhere he goes. But rather than let OCD rule his life, William challenges himself to do things that most teenagers would normally do. We're going to the Trafford Centre today to go to HMV. The Trafford Centre's, you know, away from the city centre, it's, you know, out of town. So obviously I go for opening, which is 10 o'clock, and then, you know, there's not many people there when I go. I'd feel absolutely terrified if it was really busy. I always go through the automatic doors because, you know, touching the brass handles is bacteria. You know, they'll leave a smell on my hands. Um, it could be germs, you don't know what's on there. So I know exactly where to park when I come here, research everything, including, you know, when I go to HMV, what I'm buying, the exact CDs, so that I'm not dilly-dallying, as the saying goes, you know, I'm just straight in, straight out. So I'm after that one, and that's the one. So then generally I just go and buy those, and that's me done. It's very speedy. 
in and out with him 15, 20 minutes, which is, to me, kind of a good run. If there were a few more people than this, I generally walk very quick. And I think I must look quite either distressed or anxious because obviously people are looking at me. Or that might be just how I'm feeling, that people are looking at me. William's OCD means he isolates himself from his peers and spends a lot of time in his car, which is one of his safe places. So in my boots, I have a box. I'll start with this. This is my kind of really strong antibacterial gel. It's a hand wash. This is the stuff that they use in surgery for operations, so for, to get hands really clean. Baby wipes, I go through a lot of baby wipes. I've got an endless supply of rubber gloves for um, putting petrol in my car and obviously my first aid kit. And it just gives me a sense of security that everything's safe. Anything that's associated with my car, if I don't do the ritual, something will happen to my car, most likely that I'll be in a car crash. Obviously, it's totally irrational, and I know that. But, you know, if I don't do these things, it makes me really uncomfortable. And if I'm out, I've constantly got chewing gum in, just because I know that my mouth is clean, my teeth are clean, nothing's going to penetrate the teeth, and, you know, I know that it's clean. That's why I had them white, and that's why I use the chewing gum all the time. It's not spicy, though. It's fine. It's oh. really not. Life changes can make OCD much worse. Last week, Charlie received news that the couple have to move out of their rented house. I'm terrible with, like, processing information when I get anxious, <laughs> really. Oh. We can start... With, I don't know. I don't even know when we're going to start sleeping in this new place. It's just getting our heads in gear with what's happening. As long as we know the order of things, then it's going to be fine. <laughs> With the pressure of the move mounting, Charlie's OCD starts to flare up. And it's at night before he goes to bed that his rituals are most extreme. It may sound like I don't trust my wife. It's not that, it's just my OCD. Telling me that even though Leanne said she's locked the back door, I still think it's open. Even though it looks locked, she said it's locked, I'm still going to have to put this key in the door and turn it to make sure it's locked. I have to tap this cat flap to make sure it's closed, even though we never, ever open that cat flap, literally never. I have to make sure that this door is shut. I, have to, I, I do the thing where I stare at it a lot. Um, and after all that, I can then start to go upstairs. I have to make sure the toilet lid is closed. That's a big thing, because I get worried that Cora is going to get up, fall in the toilet and drown. Tap has to be off. I have to do the thing where I stare at it a lot. I stare at it until I'm satisfied. If it drips, then it's back to square one. I know that for the rest of my life, I'm going to have this problem because it never goes away. You, you can get it, you can work on it or whatever, but it's never going to go away. And I get really, really worried that when I'm old and decrepit, and if I'm, ever, if I'm living on my own when I'm, when I'm old, that I'm going to have all these OCDs still and I'm not going to have, like, for example, I'm not, if, I get, if I get so frail that I don't have the use of my legs or my body, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to go and perform these rituals. Throughout the night, Charlie films himself as his checking takes hold. I know for a fact that I locked our back door earlier on. I know for a fact that I closed it, bolted it. Now my OCD might just just be satisfied <sighs> if I can see these two bolts are in, because then I'll know that the key was turned. But no. Here's the key. I'm going to put it in the lock and turn it left, left, just to make sure the door is definitely locked. Turned it three times. It clicked. All good. I think. Everyday tasks can be an enormous challenge for people with OCD. It's 5 a.m. in East Yorkshire. Nikita's already up and getting ready for work five hours before her shift starts. It's got to be cut into four. 
Leaving the house is a source of great anxiety for Nikita. She's so consumed by fear something terrible will happen to her mum or her dogs while she's out. When it gets to about 8 o'clock, I'll be, like, flapping about, thinking, have I forgotten this? Like, do I need this? It's not nice knowing that I'm OK now, but soon it'll arise. I check for my locker key. And then before we leave, I check it again. And then once I've left, I'll double check again. And then just before I get on the train, I double check again. Then when I'm on the train, I check. And then when I'm off, I check. Right, I'll see you tonight. Okay. Love you lot. Love you lot. Take care. Love you. Love you. Nikita works as a retail assistant and has an hour-long train journey to work. The OCD makes this daily task incredibly stressful. To me, I genuinely believe that when I go, that's the last time I'm, I'm going to see my mum, that's the last time I'll be in that house. And that's a really upsetting, terrifying thought. When I'm waiting, I sometimes message my mum and I send her eight kisses and eight hearts um, and then I'll screenshot it and then I'll wait for her reply and then I'll screenshot that as well and then I know that it'll be like a safe journey and then it's just waiting till it arrives. Before I get on, I just have to double check again that I have got everything, which my purse and my phone and then my key, which is there, so that's fine. Her anxiety has been building throughout the journey. Nikita hates crowded places, so busy train stations are extremely stressful. So when... <laughs> My voice is all wobbly. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I just feel like I've got so many seconds to get out because if I don't rush something like someone will attack me or there'll be like a bomb or a fire or someone ready to like shoot me and it, it just scares me so I just I just need to leave. Twenty-five-year-old Vicky has suffered from OCD since she was a little girl. It's something that I've always had. I've always dealt with anxiety since a child, and OCD is just a part of it, so I don't really know any different from it. I don't know what normal is or what a relaxed feeling is, because I've always had it as a child. So to me, it's just... it is normal. So that's all I do. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people understand how exhausting it is to carry around a head full of intrusive thoughts, maybe like 24 hours a day, like non-stop, and to try and do your job as well. And I don't think people understand that it makes you feel sick. I mean, all you're doing is you be out of the park. Why? Yeah. For parents who have children with OCD, it can be difficult to see them struggling. I've only got a cheap one, because I can't do the landings very good. I don't think you'll ever get a pilot's license. They worry. Like, they've seen me, like, crying under a computer desk, screaming I wanted to kill myself. They've seen me ripping clumps of my hair out. They found me when I overdosed. They've seen me take a lot of drugs. They've seen me on drugs. Shaved my head, ripped my wardrobes out. They've seen it all. 
a few years ago, I didn't think she'd still be in there. Really didn't. Not some of the fits she's had, how bad she's mm -hmm. really been. She was literally a shivering, crying wreck underneath the table. She just breaking down, wasn't she? Mm. If you'd seen her before, yeah. you'd never, you'd never this believe the, the difference. This is the best she's been for a while now, yeah, isn't it? I a mean. long time. One of Vicky's compulsions is to write lists. Her intrusive thoughts often revolve around death, so she writes lists about what would happen if someone close to her died. So this is one that I've written about somebody that I really care about, and if their family members were to pass away, it's always the three columns. The really bad column is quite extreme. Um, like, I'd kill myself, like, she's the only person to understand me and to make me laugh like that. The middle column is, like, the column that I can maybe deal with. Maybe they'll just kind of go off the grid for a week or two and then get back in touch and want friends around them. And then, like, the good column is everything will stay the same, I'll help them through it, we'll stick by her, like, help. Sounds so horrible with like funeral arrangements and things. And it comes across as really selfish because it's like, how would it affect me? But I feel like I have to be prepared for every bad situation that's going to happen in my life. Vicky now has something positive to write about as she's going on her first trip away with her boyfriend. I'm guessing this is what people take for a weekend. I have no idea because I've never gone away for a weekend. So I'm guessing this is a reasonable size bag. She's planning everything in great detail to keep her OCD at bay. Two long sleeve tops, two short sleeve tops, two like shirts, leggings, shorts, jeans. <laughs> it's literally like just from Friday to Sunday. I'll have like a huge suitcase if ever we was to go abroad. Oh my God. It's gonna take three towels for me. Already that's filled most of the bag. Vicky is worried about the journey and has been obsessively checking her car with her dad, Jonathan. Water first. Right, check that. You know where the level is. I've checked the car out before and it is fine, but we'll keep checking our just make sure no problem at all. Sorted, sorted. Back in Cheshire, 18-year-old William is facing one of his biggest fears. We're off to a petrol station. Um, to put petrol in my car. He views petrol stations as dangerous and also believes he'll be contaminated by petrol fumes as he fills up his car. If the end spot's available, I'll go there just because it's away from the centre. I see the centre is quite a dangerous place. Generally go for the front spot as well because I don't like the feeling of being trapped behind a car that, you know, waiting to put petrol in. Touching the petrol pump, just like anything like a door handle, obviously other people have touched it. Petrol fumes will be near it. It'll have, you know, possibly petrol on it itself. It's just not very clean. So I generally have gloves in my back pocket if I'm going out. I generally have a spare pair in my uh, door. The smell of the fumes really bothers me. Generally, I try not to open my mouth whilst I'm pumping the petrol into my car. I don't like the idea that fuel is going into my mouth. Generally, I'm as quick as I possibly can to come in and out. I just want to get off the petrol station as quickly as possible, just as I would wherever I am. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Having filled his car with petrol, William cleans the inside to ensure there is no contamination from the fumes. So I generally go through quite a lot of baby wipes here. So start with the steering wheel. I just cover everywhere. If I didn't clean, obviously, if there was ever an ignition in the car, whether it be the next time I start up my car, I'd think that, you know, the car's going to blow up because there are fumes inside it, or that I'm going to touch it and then it'll get onto my hands and subsequently into any food, you know, it'll cause me quite a lot of harm. Isolated from any group activities, William is a keen plane spotter. Watching the aircraft take off helps to calm his anxiety. Over there, you've got the Airbus A380, um, largest passenger plane in the world. The wingspan on the A380 is about the width of a football pitch. So it's really, really big, and it just kind of curves like a bird. Apart from at home, this is where I feel safest. I love coming to see the planes. I like coming running around here, and it's kind of my happy place, you know, away from people. Just me and the aeroplanes. 
the one thing I really want to do is get on a British Airways flight from Manchester down to Heathrow and just spend a day in London. But obviously I'm so terrified about terrorism and it's obviously so busy there. But it's, at the moment that's just a kind of a dream to do that. You know, I wouldn't feel safe doing that at all. I'm hoping to get better a lot further, you know, to go into the city centre, or to spend a day at the Trafford Centre, you know, walking around slowly rather than rushing in and out. And all these things that I can't do, but when I look at where I've come from, I know that it's still light at the end of the tunnel, as they say. And all the spray that comes off, it's fantastic. Moving house is stressful for anyone. When you have OCD, it can be much more difficult. In London, it's the day of Charlie's house move. Oh, uh, what's not fucking working? You would think somebody with OCD is more organised and wants to get everything sorted and in a certain order. But if, in my case, if anything, it probably actually, um, what's the word, um, hinders. It's, it's exhausting to have it. it and your brain's going at a thousand miles per hour, going from, from one OCD or anxiety or intrusive thought to the next one. So there's barely any room for anything else to go in there. OCDs about my new flat will start to get worse as we live there. I would really hope not as many because it's a smaller place. Just one, one floor, you know. I won't, if I need to OCD about something, I won't have to go all the way downstairs and that round the back or whatever to, to sort it out. The move goes into the night. You're bringing those abrasive sponges? No, because I've already used them. But that's a waste of two dishmatic sponges. Well, that's something you're going to have to live with, isn't it? Right. That's going to annoy me now. <laughs> Are all the windows shut, yeah? Yes. This is going through there. Bang. Done. Okay. We're out. The couple have spent their first night in their new flat, and so far, Charlie's OCD seems under control. Well, I have the main ones that come with me, doors and windows. They're, they'll go with me everywhere. The first proper ritual at the moment is to go downstairs and check that the catch is on the front door, open the front door actually, open it, close it, and then put the catch on. Not just put the catch on, have to open the front door and close it. Suddenly having to move quickly was a blessing in disguise, I think, but still didn't mean it wasn't stressful. Um, but yeah, very happy, very excited about being here. Far from being an illness that's about being organised, OCD can often compel sufferers to hoard items. Nikita believes she's holding on to memories by keeping thousands of items she hasn't used for years. Mum. Mm hmm? I've decided to actually get rid of some stuff. Maybe. Really? But can you help? <laughs> right. I'm not even going to look at that because I don't want to get rid of that. OK. That's like a dress top that I think I had when I was 13. I'll put that in the maybe pile. Um, I know for a fact... You won't wear them. I won't ever wear them because it was a fancy dress. What if they were, like, decorating clothes? You've probably heard all my excuses yeah. to keep things. No. OK. Didn't expect that one to go. Oh. Don't, <laughs> Sorry. Don't Sorry. Because... No, I think it's um, a good idea. It's gone. Mum! <laughs> oh, sorry. Is that worse? Yeah. Just don't... I'll keep then quiet. I'm like, oh. After a slow start, determination kicks in. They're just old pyjamas that I'm not even that, that's no. fine. Yeah. They can go. They can go. They're, I'm too old for them. I'll wear them. 
an old pair of shorts. Mm. But I don't really wear shorts. Well, you don't. You have got quite a lot anyway, haven't you? Yeah. So shall I? Yeah, because you. Shall you what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good lass. It's it's really stupid because none of this stuff I'll wear again. I know that. It's too young for me, or it doesn't fit me, or I just don't like it anymore. But there's that. It's like that little guy's there saying, yeah, but do you remember this memory in it? When you did this exam at school, when you went out with that person, and then that's when I feel like, oh, and then keep it. Do you see what I mean? I do, yeah. Well, yeah, to an extent. That can be a going one but I'll get a picture of it. Yep. I might just keep it. OK. No. No, I'll take a picture of it. Good. And then I'll just get rid of that. Well done. Well done. I'm proud of you. I hated every minute of that. I know you did, but you did it. Do you want to make a cup of tea? Yes. Yeah? To celebrate. Done and dusted. Yeah. Come on, boys. Go on. William has always lived at home with his parents. Keen to gain some independence and get a better grip on his OCD, he thinks that living on a houseboat is the answer believing it would free him from his greatest fear, other people. Yeah. His friend Sean is helping him to look at some boats. Oh. Oh, wow. That's it? I'm in. You're in? I like this. Of course you do. That's fabulous, isn't it? And it'd be a massive step, but it'd be a step that I really want to do. And it would kind of give me that full independence. You know, I'd just be able to be in my element. It's just a bit of a fantasy, isn't it, really? It is, but then I, when I said to you, I said it's the dream when we were talking about it, and you yeah. said it's really not. No, it's not a dream, it's achievable. Mm -hmm. It's just not very conventional. No. But then you're not very really no, conventional. I'm not very <laughs> Oh, look at that view. I'm going to have to take a picture of that. A house, it's a fixed place. I think this is slightly different, where it can be moved and it can be adjusted to, as I'm feeling, you know, if there was a terror attack nearby, for example, in a nearby city, I can just move this. I can move my safe place to miles away. And that's the idea that I really like, is having that adjustable living, I think. You know, this is perfect for me. You know, just coming on board is... You know, this is the next step for me to getting almost better, I'd say. Some bed for a broom and also a little... Oh, look at that. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> I've always maintained that, that I won't let the, the OCD defeat me. You know, I'm making good steps to getting better. I've come a long way since last year, and I'm hoping this will be the next step relatively soon to the next stage of my life, which I think will be getting close to completely managing the OCD. William is saving up and hopes to buy his very own floating home next year. I can't describe just how happy I am just sat here looking at the canal. There's nothing near you. It's just fields, trees and water. And that's it along the whole canal network. And that's just what I would describe as paradise, really. This is my paradise. Vicky managed to triumph over her demons and went on holiday with her boyfriend for the first time. Come here! Come here, look at you! Charlie and his wife have settled well into their new flat and he begins a new teaching job in September. And Nikita is working towards squashing the OCD bully through cognitive behavioural therapy, determined to live a fuller, happier life. <laughs>